by the rivers of Babylon. Yeah, we sat down and we cried when we remembered Jerusalem. We were sick, Lord, near to dying. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the creator of heaven and earth, Yehoshua Baot, the God of our ancient forefathers. Um, Thanking the creator of heaven and earth for life, food, clothing, and shelter, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Giving glory to the Most High for he is God and besides him there is no other. Thanking you all once again for joining us on another um, Tanakh review um, and sending our early Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Praying that the creator of heaven and earth be with all you, guide you, and protect you. That he will keep you, that he will watch over you. And, um, and bless each and every one of you. Um, giving due respect to the leadership of our congregation. Uh, Chief Prince Jerry L. Ben Jisaska, I'm praying that the Most High God be with him, his family, his household. I pray that the Most High God be with all of our brothers and sisters within our congregation and throughout the world. All of you who listen diligently on a weekly basis, we pray that the Creator of heaven and earth be with you all, be with all your endeavors that are done in righteousness, and I pray that the creator of heaven and earth will continue to guide you and keep you. As we do on a weekly basis, we will uh, continue to cover the, um, the Hav Torah or the, the uh, you know, for the Sidra of the previous week. This week we actually catch up as um, Nasik um, Zerishida will be going through um, the double portions of um, Matot Maaseh. And that way we will be caught up. We've been off for a couple of months, but um, at this point we're gonna catch up and everything will be back in sync. And probably just be like a week behind and that's it. Um, not a week behind, but you know how we do it. We stagger it off. He explains it after the actual um, the actual week. So, um, you know, just going over things that some people might have missed and just try to fill in or, or give some, some insight on it. So we thank you all once again. Don't forget to um, to um, subscribe, to like the videos, to share the videos to all your separate um, platforms. That's the way this message gets across by the audience's um, contribution and distributing um, to different platforms and, and letting people know what's going on. So at this moment, I'm going to pass over the mic to um, a man who is um, a mentor to me, one of my teachers, um, Nasik Zrishid Abin Yehuda. How are you, Nasik? Uh, uh, great. First of all, I'd like to praise the Supreme Town Universe, God of my forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, and uh, do respect to the platform on the DCB platform, uh, a spiritual leader, Chief Prince Jerry Abin Yasaska, also to the host, Chief Uzael, to the princes, chiefs, brothers, sisters, um, um, the rabbinate, uh, Maureen, uh, Connie, and um, visitors to the channel, I greet you all in the tongue of my forefathers. Uh, shalom Aleichem and um, early Shabbat Shalom. Adonai Sabdati Dakufi Yagi Tila Theaka, O Lord, undam my lips and my mouth shall declare thy praise. I'll be uh, covering, and um, as uh, Chief Uzel had said, um, the half Torah of uh, Maasei. And like I said in the past, uh, most half Torahs was done in order, you know, when we was prohibited, it actually came into being, just a reminder, um, that it came into being simply by different, um, the, the sages, the, rabbi, uh, or the rabbinists, uh, when they had, was prohibited from reading the actual Kumish, the first five books. So they usually would have something in the, from the prophets, the um, different writings and stuff like that <coughs> uh, related to the subject matter of uh, the, the Sidra they would normally read every week. So 
Um, some say it started from the earliest of Greek period. Some not narrowed down even to the Roman period, which is even later, but um, sources would lean more to from the Hasmonean period when a lot of things were prohibited. So that's um, <clears throat> one of the areas that <clears throat> we consider. <clears throat> and um, uh, like, uh, like um, I would like to just point out that those that might read New Testament, uh, just for various reasons, um, you'll find an example of the hop tour being expressed by the guy they, you know, they hold, you know, close to them, you know, and it says his custom was on the on the Sabbath day to get get up and read out the book of the law, but he was reading from the book of Isaiah. So, and Isaiah is really considered, you know, part of a hop Torah. So, um, hence that's um, <clears throat> some glimpse so you could get in reference, which is, I'm only pointing it out for, because being diaspora and this diaspora, and a lot of people is, um, that might, and was not born or raised up in this way of life, um, they might, you know, you have some confusion about what, it, what we consider the book of the law or the Kumash, the first five books, as opposed to the whole script, um, Tanakh, which is really just an acronym for Torah, you know, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and then the writings. So <clears throat> with that being said, um, now we from the 17th of uh, the month of Tammuz, uh, and we into the month of Av, um, for those three weeks to the ninth of all, as I spoken last time, we uh, all the haftoros, we got haftor for admonishment. And then after the three haftor for admonishment, then we got seven of comfort. And so now the haftor has very little to do with the actual sidra that we be reading. It has more to do with the calendar and the time and event in our, in, in our history. Um, when I, I one thing I just want to point out while my, my backtrack into some of the and highlight some of the things in the Sidra itself before I go into the Hop Torah is that from the 17th of Tammuz, you know, we know that the Babylonians had breached the walls in Jerusalem. Now they already had siege, had siege behind, had a siege out there for months. And we know that one of the remarkable things about it is that when they breached the wall around the 17th of Tammuz, that, you know, and especially in the Roman period, it's a more accurate time. And like I said in the first speaking um, earlier talks, that the Jeremiah was show like it might have been the ninth or something like that at Tammuz. But um, um, that's another, another issue. But traditionally, they say the 17th of Tammuz. So the three weeks period between Tammuz, 17th Tammuz, and also the um, 9th of all. So when the Babylonians had breached the wall into uh, the city of Jerusalem, that means that sacrificing in the temple stopped. So that means that it was a serious, you can imagine how much fighting and bloodshed went on for three weeks because the Babylonians wasn't thinking just get there the 17th they was there already the siege but took them that long to be able to break the walls and crash into the walls and have a breach in the walls in Jerusalem and then after that the fighting occurred vicious fighting if you can imagine and some people fight defending their, their loved ones and their families and, and their belief system as well and so that's when, when that's when that means that the daily sacrifices have ceased at that particular time. And then, you know, we know the history that the Babylonians came in and when they finished, you know, destroying the majority of the people there, then they wind up burning uh, the temple down to the ground. So <clears throat> we have a lot to be remorseful for uh, because it's because of our, our um our lack of uh, observance, you know, to Torah. But I just want, before we go into that, I'd like to just go back over and hit on some of the the, the, the sidros. That's normally a double sidra most years. It's my tot and my say. My tot itself 
um, is used as tries, but also means stick, uh, sticks. And it has the same show, it's just the word, um, when I say same show, it's the same root letters as the a mem, you know, a tape, you know, and, uh, you know, that, you know, and, and a hey. All right, so uh, that was pronounced different. They had the same root as mita, which is bed. So it's, it's and so my toe is translated and pronounced for mate as a tribe. So we say mate could be a tribe or or a staff, a stick. But you know, it's it, it's, um, it's 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 some, something to consider when you look into it about the legitimacy of airship. So um, I used to like to bring out myself just from my viewpoint, not saying, you know, read it anywhere, just from my viewpoint, that um, I used to bring out that it shows about more so the genuine lineage of a people. We talk about beds and staff uh, uh, and tribes, tribal, because say, is this really a, a Israelite or he's a half-breed Israelite? You know, he might be this and claim to be an Israelite. Like we have a lot of problems with that today, you know, identity problems. So um, I usually focus more on that, you know, with the, uh, I always say, well, the me time is that it's, in a, it's not conceived outside of a, a, a illegitimate uh, situation, so to speak. So now, but one of the interesting things is that what is the difference between uh, you know, if we use the term staff, and then with my say, which is normally combined, means journeys and stages of development in the journey. So that's not traveling, but it means a journey of development as well. <clears throat> so what, why would these two things, what do they have in common? So if we think of my toe as a staff, just to start off with, you would think of it as a staff is a dry stick that's rigid, non-giving. If you try to make it bend, you break it. It'll break before it bend. So it's more rigid. And my say when you're traveling, it's more, you know, flexible. You know, you're, you're more flexible because you're going outside of, you know, different spots. You're not settled in one particular area. So what moral um, lesson we could try to extrapolate from that is that in some areas, we need to be rigid. We need to be steadfast. We, 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 we don't need to compromise when it comes to certain Torah laws. There's no need to compromise on that. A principle that given from God, from the creator himself, we're not supposed to compromise. Uh, but then it's sometimes there might be a, a thing or, or an area where you must relax and exercise an area of compassion and step out of that rigidity to be able to move. And um, <clears throat> give you a, a case in point. Um, and I just do something that's pretty much close to home. Uh, since we're coming up, you know, in the fair and just this one example, there's many examples and stuff, but one example uh, I, could, I could come up with just to save time um, that Say a fast come up. When we talk about the fast of Yom Kippur. I used to write that one, not the fast of Tisha B'Av. I used the one about Yom Kippur that comes up. <clears throat> and a person uh, supposed to be aff afflicting, you know, their soul on Yom Kippur. And the way we do it, most of us, is that, you know, we come to the agreement that not denying ourselves food and drink is the way we afflict our soul for that particular time. Uh, you have a person at the time become dehydrated or on some serious medication where they cannot go more than eight hours without that medication or else they're subject to die. Do you uh, uh, give them their medication or you don't? Some people need can't feed themselves and they need to be fed. Do you feed them or you don't on that particular day? So that's when you got to say, well, all right, the flexibility of certain things you have to exercise. Um, that's where the Ma said you got to travel sometimes outside of your normal comfort zone. You know, and, and, and so 
sometimes you, you keep you know, it's good to be rigid and sometimes good to be flexible but also what's taking place in this chapter it starts off with vows you got to be about your words and um we talked about uh, i talked about a little bit last time about vows and when it comes to relationships um you know um in a household who has the last word concerning a vow and this is scripturally orientated so um you know if, if a woman's married her husband got the last word in her father's house he has the last word about whether she's going to keep this vow or not when they hear it because <clears throat> when you read about it if the day they hear it and they don't say anything against it all right the vow you made all right they bear part of the consequences so therefore he might annul the vow because you'd say well she made the vow she the one that keep it. Why should I bear part of the consequences before the vow she made? So that's just one way to look at it. But I'm just gonna move on from that and just bring out, you know, another area uh, that, that was covered in um, my tools. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we had is um, in 11, uh, the 31st chapter of uh, my tools. 13 first, and said, and Moses and Eleazar the priests, and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. Now this, oh, I better start from the top. Um, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. After, afterwards shall thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spoke unto the people saying, arm ye men from among you for the war that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. Of every tribe, a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to war. So there was delivered out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, 12,000 armed men of war, for war. All right, and Moses sent, sent them a thousand of every tribe to the war, them and Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war with the holy vessels and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. And they warred against Midian as the Lord commanded. And they, and they slew every male. And they slew the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain. Evi, Evi and Rechem and Zor. Uh, that's, the, that's the guy I couldn't remember his name. That's the father of Cosby. And Hur and Rabbah, the five kings of Midian. Balaam also the son of Baal, uh, the son of uh, Baal, they slew with the sword. And the children of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones and all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. They took for a prey and for all and all and all and all their cities and the places where they dwelt, all their encampments they burned with fire and they took all the spoil and all the prey, both a man and a beast. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and to Eleazar, the priest, and to the congregation of the children of Israel, and to the camp, unto the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan at Jericho. All right, so now only 12,000 guys, we lost 24,000 in the plague. <clears throat> And the creator wanted us to basically go and fight against Midian, not against Moab. Moab had a genuine fear, uh, fear, the king of Moab and, and the people of Moab. But what Midian doing getting involved in the business and causing us to mess up? And look where Bilam is at. Bilam is over in Midian. You know, so... And he wound up dying. And he remember, we remember earlier, they said, you know, he wanted to die the death of the righteous. You must live a righteous life. So when he was, and he was slain by the sword. I mean, it's all that power that he had in his mouth when judgment came from him from on high. You know, that was a problem. The sword that the angel sought to slam with is a sword that the nation of Israel 
wind up slaying them with. That's something to consider <clears throat> as we go forward. And the 13th verse, and Moses and, 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 and Moses and, and Ellis are the priests, and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet uh, them without the camp. And was rough with the officers of the host and the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds who came from, um, from the service of the war. And Moses said unto them, have ye saved all the women alive? Uh, behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. So that's where you find where Balaam counseled them to do something against us, to revolt so as to break faith with the Lord in the matter of Peor. And so the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that have no man by lying with them. But all the women, children that have not no man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. And it can't ye without the camp seven days, where so, whosoever have killed any person and whosoever had touched any slain, purify yourselves on the third and on the seventh day, ye and your captives, as to every garment and all that is made of skin and all works of goat's hair and all things made of wood, you shall purify. Um, now, I just want to bring out this one little thing here. <clears throat> and Elias the priest and the man of war that went in the battle. This is a statue of the Lord which the Lord hath commanded Moses. I be at the goal. All right, so I just want you to focus on that verse there. After Moshe, they came back. First of all, we got a lot of stuff that went down. I'm just I'm, I'm gonna be brief on it because y'all heard the story, but I'm, I'm gonna try to hopefully highlight some different areas. <clears throat> One, they just killed the top prince, a top prince of Simeon, for having a Midianite woman. And they not only brought back many and I men that they caught captive, or boys, as you would say, but also all the women, not just the cattle. And they burned the cities down. Five kings. That's a lot of lot, lot, lot of people, a lot, a lot, a lot of spoil. And they burned all them down, you know, all that city down, and brought all the people that didn't slay back, just 12,000 guys. So now you would say, did they learn with Zimri what happened? Did they realize on the beginning, this is something you could, you know, talk about, that if the creator told you to avenge them of the Midianites, take vengeance on them because of what they did to us and make us go against him. Who where will your allegiance lie? And in the battle. And you kept all the women, it's indiscriminate, just females, period. Did the lust subside or was it still there? What was the mentality of the warriors that went there? So these are some of the things that, you know, you know, it could take a lot of discussion, you know, and, and amongst your various leaders and teachers, because uh, <clears throat> it's right afterwards. And the creator even showed a certain type of kindness you know, in a sense, uh, concerning not sending the princes, but sending officers, you know, saws, captains, generals of the of, of the armies of the thousands that are out there for a tribe. That means because the tribe of Simeon had lost their top individual. And then some, you know, I, I spoke on this when I did the Sidra more so, in reference to um, what would they bring out in reference to um, the, uh, I'm going to spoke on the Sidra in, this, in the sense that, um, just lost my stop and start for a second, knock on the door, that um, at the time that all the officers, uh, all, uh, only officers went there, no prince from each tribe went out. So the creator showed some kind of kindness to the tribe of Simeon because they didn't have their top press around. All the other tribes had their top press around. And as we go, go through a little bit later on, we're going to um, see a little bit more of somewhat uh, a little bit of kindness and compassion 
in reference to the tribe of Simeon that lost their top prince. But meanwhile, what we have here in this in this area, we have an area where they instituted in this particular um, case um, about you know keeping only the um, the women that had not known man. If women was a problem, why keep any of them? Something you could discuss. If there was a problem, why keep any of them? Why permit them to keep any of them? And then the priest, Eleazar, who's Moses' nephew, point out something more uh, seemed like it seemed like to be more important about keeping kosher, kashru. You have a certain laws that's developed here. It said, <clears throat> because we're not trying to get that land. <clears throat> so uh, you bring about the pots, you know, utensils, the vessels and stuff like that, you know, spoons, whatever you is going to use to eat and cook with. Said so that had to be purified. So now when you say purified, that's what they have, you know, they have um, those that follow a strict, strict uh, rabbinic style of kashru. Um, they know even if you buy sometimes dishes from the that's new from the um, supermarket that's brand new, never been used. Sometimes they, they take a dip and they take it to the, uh, what they refer to as the mikvah, which is mikvah, you know, and have it immerse. Um, just a ritually immerse, and then, you know, then they are permitted to eat out of it. Spoons, forks, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you don't, if you don't take it to that, you can take it to any flowing body of water, certain types of lakes, any river, any ocean, and do the exact same thing. Those that want to do a strict cash root law. Those things that had to go through the fire, go through the fire, and those things that had to go through water, go through water. But even the ones that went through the fire had to be still immersed. That according to uh, certain cash root laws and customs. I'm just sharing that out now that this is where they extrapolate that from, from this here particular thing that we find and you know the Eleazar points out to Moses that this is most important now. Now, if you say, okay, uh, the food, then, you know, you know what, what kind of uh, leftover or, or grain would the food would be, even if they went through the fire or anything like that. So now, even if, it, uh, if, even if they didn't, just for instance, had fire, I mean, had pork in whatever the case is, some unclean meat, whatever the case is, in the, in the pots and, and plates, Everything is exposed by the dead. So just like the people had to be purified, you know, with the waters of sprinkling, just that human beings are sprinkled on the third and the seventh day, you had to immerse and had the water sprinkled on everything, even the stuff that went through the fire for purification because of the contact with the dead. So that is something that we must, you know, consider you know, and, and that, hence, that's why Moses and Eleazar met those guys outside the camp and not inside the camp. Not only did they unclean by the dead, but everything they touched was unclean by the dead. And any open vessel was uh, unclean by the dead. So that is one of the things about what is important right now is being able to purify these people so we could at least get our people back as part of the congregation. So um, I just want to um, bring out that little area there. And, you know, and then they talk about dividing the, um, the, the, the loot, uh, the spoil amongst um, the children of Israel. Though the ones who went to battle had the greatest share, but they still had to share with the rest of the people. And that's what David learned this year from coming from um, this particular battle. But uh, what is interesting is that also, I like I brought out when I when I spoke on the Sidra, is the guilt complex of some of these twelve guys. Um, that why would uh, you know when they brought they divided everything else, then the next thing you know they start bringing up the jury. So the, the the jury they kept separate from the spoils that was apparent, and uh, and and then when they realized that all of us no we didn't lose not one soul. That's when they come up with the, the the jury as part of the spoil. So there again, you got to 
to say, well, let me analyze some of the mindset of the people that win. The events that took, for, uh, took, took place first in battle, victory in battle, coming back with everything, and not realizing that the same women that causes the problem, the same one that lost the top, the top guy, causes, and, and some other top leaders in the nation, 24,000 people died. And then not only um, that area there, they still felt a little bit guilty about not exposing all that they had. So those are some of the things that are the takeaways and consider when we look at that, that particular battle that I like to, you know, bring out from time to time. Um, and um, so that was part of the officer's atonement. Uh, then we goes into the into the area about uh, the true uh, now in the third, second chapter the, uh, the children of Reuben and Gad had very great multitude of cattle when they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead that behold the place was a place for cattle All right? and children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoken to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to all and unto the princes of the congregation saying, Atorot and Diblon and Jazir and Nimrah and Keshbon and Elile and Simbam and Nebo and beyond the land which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle and thy servants have cattle. And they said, if we found favor in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession. Bring us not over the Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? And wherefore will ye turn away the hearts of the children of Israel from going over unto the land which the Lord had given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. All right, so now. He, 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 uh, Moses got upset behind it, and um, and then remind him. So you sound, you sounded like them people, uh, your, your, your ancestors, your father, forty years ago. Because now you don't want to go into the land. You want to stay here. You want you want to cite them not going back. You know, fought over here. Everybody fought together. You didn't get win that land by yourself. Everybody fought for that land. So, uh, but like I brought out, and when I spoke on that before was why would Moses um, take it to that level when he could just say, say no? He said, if they, they said, if you find favor, so if he said no, that means they would go along with it. But he come with it, you know what I mean? You know, you know um, a strong um, attitude, you know, against that particular area. Now, we read several things here. You know, from the Midianite, um, and 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 my told, you know, and the, and people coming back, Moses upset with them, which was actually, um, and in, in, in a sense, where Moses was upset, and it's, this is really where he getting upset at the last period of his life. Now, some anger was justified in Moses' life. Some was not justified in his life. All right, so sometimes, you know, I mean, we got to realize when anger is justified, we have the righteous indignation, and when it's not justified. And also, I like to bring out as we go into the next part of my city, uh, was that um, when we talk about 12,000, and Moses both put fight the Midianites and then die. And we know Joshua is going to be the one that's to see uh, Moses. They have this here um, commentary on it, which I, I tend to see the value in it, is that the 12,000 would be, you know, that, that the Ephraimites didn't uh, take a play, uh, take take a part in that for several reasons, which I spoke on when I did the sigil before, that, um, that the Levites for the first time would enter the battle. And fight for vengeance for the God's name. And why would the Levites involve themselves in this particular battle? 
as opposed to any other battle, when usually Levites is not counted as, uh, into the warfare of the nation of Israel. Uh, and one of the reasons that's um, used is that most of the warfare we fought was to acquire land. The Levites was not going to inherit land. So therefore, they didn't have to fight for land. But now is a fight for the sanctification of God's name and for the glory of God. That they could do because nobody was going to get any of the land of Midian. We read that they destroyed all the cities and burnt it down. They only brought back spoil, but they weren't trying to stay there or settle there. Also, it would look kind of hard on Joshua because people are going to think the way they think that if the tribe of Ephraim participated, it's because they want their man to be the next guy in charge right away and to be almost like pushing your teacher out or, or off to the side real quick. So it's a lot of things you can discuss in those areas there. I just want to bring that out because I, I spoke on it when I did the Sidra a while back. Uh, and um, then, then the last thing I want to bring out in this particular portion, well, is about... Um, we know we know they had to go ahead and you know, they wind up you know going in and fighting with the children of um, Israel. That was part of their agreement. They was going away for fourteen years. I'm I, I'm sure they didn't foresee themselves being gone for fourteen years. Now, um, and it's one of the strange things that God took the lead over Reuben. You know, in that sense. Now when we go into Marseille, the journeys, and one of the things I like to ask about the journeys is that why is it that you need to enumerate all the places we've been in the 40 years. And it never say how long we stayed in any of those places, you know, when he enumerated them. But the creator told us to enumerate, I uh, told him what Moses to enumerate all the places that we went, we was at in the 40 years, which is 42 different stops. And most of them, for the most part, is where we did wrong. So who want to remember those places where I got to look at my own, um, you, know, you know, infidelities and be reminded of that. But sometimes to look and see where you fail that is only then that you're able to progress and heal. So this was some of the things about, you know, development. But yet, even when we had a lot of failures on the way, it's brought out in this particular portion that the creator still was with us all, all, all the time during that particular time, all right? And so um, when, we, when we pass through that, we um, pass through that area, and the say we goes on and, um, and read more so about the borders of the land, all right? And when we read about the borders of the land in, in the 34th chapter, um, one of the things we gather from it in 34th chapter of Numbers that when we deal with the borders of the land, <clears throat> that they, you know, it, it's described up there. Um, they don't describe nothing on the, the side that Gad, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh wind up being on. So that lets you know that that was never intended to be part of Israel. And hence, it's not on the same level as the land that was promised to the patriots. And the ideal borders was going up as far as the Mediterranean in certain areas. So all the descriptions that we read about, about the land and how far the borders are supposed to stand, extend, which is actually the promised land, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Reuben, and half of the tribe of Manasseh that part of the land wasn't technically counted as part of the nation of Israel. Now, you're going to have a lot more discussions on it, you're going to have, which I'm sure and a lot of questions in reference to it. Because with me saying that, then you got to say, well, uh, that part, is that part of the land subject to uh, first fruits? Is that part of the land is subject to uh, sabbatical observance? Uh, uh, and, um, you know, um, is that part of the land 
is subject to mingling seeds. So these are things that you might want to talk about and explore, you know, amongst your various teachers, because when we read about the description of the land, cross the Jordan that was promised and the boundaries of the land, that side is not included. And since that side is not included, then it raises, it should raise a lot of questions. You know, what is what, what is what is the law concerning those things I just mentioned? All right. So now, you know, uh, which is only when you get into the land. And it's only concerning the land. So, and if they and if they didn't comply with, and I'll throw this one out there too as well. If they didn't comply with the they oath, they go and help the other tribes conquer the land, they could not have that land on that side. They were supposed to get a spot on the other side of the joy and not that side. So that's something that, you know, you might want to discuss even more because you got laws involved with the land. You got laws about, uh, you know, uh, you know, is that Israel? Is that not Israel? Even today, they're having discussions and arguments about the boundaries and territories of Israel all right, until this very day. And it only became official inheritance to them once the other guys had conquered their side. That's the only time it would be official inheritance. Now, I'm going to bring up some more um, that you might want to um, consider even further um, in that. But, uh, but, I, but I'm going to go on this order here first. All right. And in the, in the 34th chapter, which I've spoken on before, that uh, in the 16th verse, it said, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, these are the names of the men that shall take possession of the land for you. Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and ye shall take one prince of every tribe to take possession of the land. And these are the names of the men of the tribe of Yehuda, Caleb, the son of Yephune, of the tribe of the children of Shimon, Shemuel, the son of Amikhu, of the tribe of Benjamin, Elidah, the son of Shalom. And then we get into um, this 22nd verse, and of the tribe of the children of Dan, a prince, Buki, the son of Yugli. And of the children of Yosef, of the tribe of the children of Manasseh, a prince, Kaniel, the son of Kephar, and of the tribe of the children of Ephraim, a prince, Timuel, the son of Shiftan, and of the tribe of the children of Zebulon, a prince, Elisaphan, the son of Parnak, and of the tribe of the children of Issachar, a prince, Patiel, the son of Zion, and of the tribe of the children of Asher, a prince, Amikhu, Akihu, the son of uh, Shilomi, and of the tribe of Naphtali, a prince, uh, Padiel, the son of Amihu. These are they whom the Lord had commanded to divide their inheritance unto the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. Now, hence brings a little bit more to the issue I want to put out as we go. And that is, as we look at this here, the first three guys are not called princes, even though we know they are prince. But they're not called princes. Shimon is within that first three. He's sandwiched up between Yehuda and Benjamin. But after that, when we get to Don, everybody is called a prince of the tribe. We have something similar when it came to the dedication, whereas the prince of Judah did, uh, 40 years ago, Nakshan, he's not referred to as a prince, though we know he's the prince of the tribe. Everybody else after him was called a prince. So that, you know, should be, well, why they don't call these first three guys princes when they say all of them was a prince and these are called by name? Moses didn't select them. The creator selected them. So the creator selected every one of these guys. But why they don't say prince in front of the tribe of Judas, uh, Caleb? We know Caleb was a prince from years back, <laughs> you know, but I'm saying it's not used there, you know. And Caleb was not the 
top prince of the tribe of Yehuda, but he was the eldest prince of the tribe of Yehuda by his age and seniority. He became pretty much the one that created, recognized because it stand to reason he the only one got land promised to him on that side. So ain't that something? He the only one that's like have land promised to him ahead of time. But he's not called a prince. And then Shimon, we know what just happened in the 40th year. <clears throat> so he's not called a prince. Sam, uh, and, also, and, uh, and, I, and I also made a relationship with the officers that fought. <clears throat> and then Benjamin. So those are um, some of the elements there. And then why those tribes, just the other uh, two and a half tribes, half of Manasseh is on this side, half of Manasseh is on the other side. Uh, that's another story. But just the um, same time, I'm going to go into the, um, they, had, they had these Levitical cities and ref cities of refuge for a person that killed somebody ignorantly. And then it goes on to the last uh, uh, chapter um, about, um, about the um, rules of inheritance and you know, the inheritance of the, of the daughters. And it, and it talk about the, the daughters of Zalofriaz who had, the, had um, uh, one of their father's inheritance on the other side, not that side, on the other side of the Jordan. Right? And we know that um, later on the rules came in that they, um, the tribe of half the other tribe, tribe of Nassau said, look, if it's on the other side of Jordan, uh, they got married within the family. So, um, and then these rules came out about, you know, where if a, if a woman, if a father died and only had daughters, then the daughters inherit, but they must marry within their tribe. And I couldn't marry outside the tribe. So that's pretty much where it's going to end at. And in 13 verses, it says, these are the commandments in the audience. I should say 13 verses, the third, sixth chapter. These are the commandments and the audiences which the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses unto the children of Israel and the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. And normally when you finish a book, you, you know, they had this tradition. They say, Kazak, Kazak, when he could say, be strong, be strong, and let's make one another strong uh, because we had finished a particular episode. But um, one of the things I'd like to, uh, well, I'd like to bring out and before we go into the Haftorah and Jeremiah, is that throughout the whole book of, uh, well, from, from the time of Exodus, but when we left out of Egypt, in Moses' period, until the end of Deuteronomy, we talk about the land. We talk about the inheritance. We set up how we're going to choose our inheritance. And yet, it's not fulfilled within those first five books. They had to read Joshua and read the book of Joshua to say, okay, we reach our goal. So what underlying message can we get from that? You know, we talk about the journeys we had for 42 years and our journey was to get to the destination of the promised land. And one of the takeaways I, I usually try to share is that, you know, it's not always the destination, it's the journeys that one takes towards that destination for development. And then once you reach the destination, the journey is still not over. So that's what it is when you talk about the progress is that you might have a destination, you reach your destination, but is your journey in life over? So we're gonna go into the book of Jeremiah, the first cha uh, second chapter, uh, fourth, fourth verse. And according to the Ashkenazis, they stop at the uh, uh, 28th chapter, uh, 28th verse, and they, they go and read one verse from the third, which would be the fourth. And the Sephardim, they um, stop at the 28th and skip over to the fourth chapter and read one and two verses. I would um, just share both of them, just both points. So when you get it, um, Chief, you could start off. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're in the book of Jeremiah chapter two, starting from verse four, right? Right, correct. Verse four, hallelujah. Amen. Hear ye the word of Yehovah, O house of Yaakov, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith Yehovah, 
What unrighteousness have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after things of naught, and are become naught? Neither say they, Where is Jehovah that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? Hold on, just stop before we get to the seventh. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the things is, you know, the first chapter of Jeremiah, the, uh, and, uh, and the Sidra, that's read, known when um, Mato um, comes, um, you know, I mean, you know, you know, when we, had, when, when they, when, they um, uh, when the first chapter we read last, last week, the first, first um, anime, uh, and, uh, admonishment for what we're doing wrong. I, we know that um, Jeremiah 1 is opened up in the first 10 verses of Jeremiah, is really a resume of Jeremiah and his job. And then um, knowing that, you know, he's going to have problems, you know what I mean? They had to bring with some bad messages and bad news, you know? And we're then here, the creator is asking, you know, you know, you know and when he asks, he said, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things is, you know, what unrighteousness have your fathers found to me? I mean, did somebody tell you something about me that I was no good? I mean, and 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 and, and you know what's so ironic? What is so ironic, as wicked as we was, you know, we never said God was no good in the 40 year period that Moses had that problem with them people. Nowhere in, in you know in that 40 year period that we actually said. The creator was no good. That's something to consider. But it's the, and the creator said, did y'all hear somebody here about me? I mean, your fathers. And a lot of them died, like I say, in a 40 year period. Died in, 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 in the wilderness. Some got killed in the wilderness. But yet not one of them ever said that the creator was unrighteous. So that, so that, that, that and, uh, and you know what, and I always, I'm always amazed about the, the type of creator we serve, Hashem, when we serve him, simply because if you go back in any mythology, and I always have to go back to that stuff, these, these myths and legends and stuff like that, you never read where anybody's deity is not only, you know, pleading their case to the people that are supposed to serve them, you know what I mean? But our God does that. And they're not even a deity. The people of ancient times just say, look, I just don't want you to hurt me. Whatever God they worship, I just don't want you to hurt me. I need you to stay out the way. Let me do me, so to speak. But yet the creator, you know, not only allow us to bring them on trials we read, you know, but also he asking, you know, did you hear something I didn't hear? But let's read a little bit further. Seven. Verse 7 reads, And I brought you into a land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. But when you uh -huh. entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. All right, now but, I'd like to just bring out a clue to the eighth verse. It says, Through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. All right. If no man passing through it, you know nobody's staying there. That's number one. You know, so that seemed like, you know, 101. If nobody passing through, nobody's going to stay there. But why bring this up? Because they use the term Adam. They don't use the word Ish there in that verse. And Adam, you know, this is just, uh, uh, I would say, a, a rabbinic interpretation for the most part. You know, you can, you can take it or leave it. Um, that... It would, you know, pretty much post been decided which, you know, which which would be the habitable lands for people and around the world. And so when even after the uh, deluge of the flood, we we're supposed to fill the earth and scatter abroad. And most people scattered and went to certain areas that they actually settled and developed civilizations throughout this whole um, planet. Um, and migration, because of certain um, things, they might have you know, move from here and shift it from there. But basically where they genuinely settled, great civilizations you can find on the 
Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere, great civilizations. Um, and so what we, what we find here is that in a place that nobody makes claims to the desert, say, that's my territory, don't stay off it. Nobody say that. Even, even when you go to Vegas in the desert, you know, uh, nobody say, that's my property out there. The biggest thing they got in Vegas is that, that strip. Now, now, that's the closest anybody tried to develop a, a, a desert in modern times. In, 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 in ancient times, and somebody else that tried to develop, develop a desert was, um, they say, Nebuchadnezzar, when he had to hang a guy in Babylon for, for a princess that he got, you know, because it, it, was, it, it was barren. And she was homesick from what the story go, how the story goes. So here it is that you went through a place like that and, and that and God provided for you there in a place like that. And then now when you get to the land, you can see the fruit of the land. You've seen the fruit before you even got there. You see the produce before you got there. So now you're in a place that's supposed to be productive. All right, pick it up in eight. Verse eight. It reads, <clears throat> the priest said not, where is Yehoah? And they that handled the law knew me not. And the rulers transgressed against me. And the prophets also prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. <clears throat> All right, now, before we go tonight, before we go tonight, mm -hmm. I just got to focus on a couple of things here. Jeremiah, he's not starting from the bottom and say, all oh, y'all's no good. He pointing out people of responsibility that is no good. And this is what the creator want him to point out. Don't tell, just say, hit everybody, blanket statement to everybody, you know what I mean, in a whole nation, but hit the guys that's responsible for leading and teaching the people in the nation. Them the guys you hit first. That's why, you know, when people jockey to be, you know, leaders and, you know, teachers or heads of congregations, stuff like that. Most guys that have been there say, man, I wish I could slide out, but then I'd be embarrassed. They're embarrassed to slide out. Not, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Not that they want the job in the first place. They're just embarrassed. Uh, well, if I could ease out and somebody could get in there that could hold it down good, then I, you know, I felt I did my job. So you don't mind stepping to the side and Moses somebody, you know, or Aaron somebody that you know could do the job. But when you know it, ain't nobody do the job, and the job be, you know, hectic, traumatic, and you say, I don't want the job just like Jeremiah didn't want the job. I don't want that kind of job. But then you can't slide out the job. But once it's, but once the people's doing good, you want to step out the way as soon as possible. You know, as soon as your child learn how to cook in the house, you say, all right, go fix dinner. You know, you say, go fix dinner. Cause you learn how to cook. And you don't, you don't want, you know, you, you don't mind. You will eat the dinner they fix because they learn how to cook, wash dishes, because they learn how to clean and wash dishes. So the thing is that Jeremiah coming for the leaders, the responsibilities of the priests, the kings, he, he he not pulling any punches. So when we get into the, and, and you know, I mean, and such prophets and stuff like that, all right, rulers, all right, keep going. Night. <clears throat> Verse nine, it reads, "Wherefore I will, <coughs> sleek I. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, save Yehovah, and with your children's children will I plead, for okay. pass over to the isles of the Kittites, and see and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently and see if there have been such a thing. <coughs> have a nation changed its gods, which yet are no gods? But my people have changed its glory for that which doth not profit." Hold right there. All right, everybody kept their tradition. No matter how foolish it was, they had a tradition. Uh, uh, tradition. That they never changed their tradition, no matter how foolish, how absurd, you know, bizarre it sounds. Other nations pretty much can't, uh, have that. And even if they say, okay, I know it's bogus, what part of it I can still keep? That's what they look at. No matter what, say, so what part of that I can still keep? Hence, in the, in the Catholic Church, they kept some of the stuff that was cool because the other people that worship sun god and worship Astarte and all that kind of stuff, they said, okay, we're going to redub it, reboot it, and give it a whole new meaning. 
because they want to keep some of the old ways. But we ourselves, we, we, we answer to a higher source. And, and so, but the creator said, even in their foolishness, they loyal and true. And, and that's what's comparison here. So now, and it says, and, and they say, they don't, and they, they, they don't gain anything behind it. But the 12th verse says, Verse 12, it reads, <clears throat> Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye exceeding amazed, saith Jehovah. For oh, my people. Yeah, you know what's funny about that? When I look at that verse, I, I, I enjoy, you know, um, in a sense of, you know, um, looking, analyzing, and considering that if the Creator said, Hey, heavens, you should be, you should be astonished. You should be shocked. This is the heavens that He made. You should be shocked. If they don't want no part of me, what do you think about you? And people worship the sun, the, sun, the stars, the moons, and all that kind of stuff. They say, if they don't want me, now you should be astonished, man, because I made you. <laughs> so, so that that is um something, you know, every time I look at that, I say, wow, you know, that that is, you know, talking about amazed and talking about you should be afraid. Keep going. Verse 13, it reads. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Right it's, then, there. we're gonna work for something that's gonna profit. We got free water running, free water running, and yet we're gonna say, "Nah, I'm gonna dig my own well. I'm gonna make my own system." And and now, when you're digging something, you got water over here. You don't want that. You're going to dig a spot where there's no water at, and hopefully you got to put some water in there. Hopefully some water going to come in. And it still ain't going to hold it because it's going to have leaks and cracks in it. That's what we did. That's what the creator is saying. You got this here freely, and you're going to go ahead and work for something that you already got free? But let's go a little bit further. Verse 14, it reads... Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why has he become a prey? I, I, and now servant, all right? He asked him very quick. You know, and he used the name Israel because Israel itself wasn't servants in Egypt. In Egypt it is, it, the Hebrews was a servant in, in, in Egypt at that time. You know, and that's what Pharaoh recognized. But even though he's the first one to call us the nation of Israel, he's the first one to call it, recognize Israel as a nation, but Throughout most of the time I was in Egypt, it's the Hebrews. It's the Hebrews. And saying, look, you're in the land. You're Israel now. And then a homeborn slave, that means, you know, <clears throat> that means when you're born into a, 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 into a, a handmaid. You know how a servant that have a child to their master. So that's all it is. You know, she's, a, she's, she's um, not even the master's concubine. She happened to be a servant under a master's house care. And say, did you come out through a, a you know a, a, a route like that? But your mother something on, on that level. So you weren't even you, you didn't become a slave, and you wasn't born into servitude. That's what he's saying. Read a little bit further. Verse fifteen reads: The young lions have roared upon him, and and let their voice resound. And they have made his land desolate. His cities are laid waste without inhabitant. The children of Toph and Tapankes feed upon the crown of thy head. Is it not this that doth cause it unto thee? That thou hast forsaken Jehovah thy God when he led thee by the way? And now, uh, now we're talking about, we're talking about it's Egypt, but it's a, a corruption of the pronunciation of names. You can find it later, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'll pick it up in 18. Verse 18 reads, And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt, to drink the waters of she Shehor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thou backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and a bitter thing that thou hast forsaken Jehovah thy God 
neither is my fear in thee, save your whole God of hosts. All right, there, we're going to 20, uh, 20 verse. All right, right down there, let you know um, that we depend on foreigners, you know, and so why would this come up? We related to the Babylonians out here. That's why this is read there. This is admonish us as a whole, you know, but um, we're going to try to um, get through this a little bit more. We're going to read all this is out. Um, but just keep on reading. I just, I'll wait till we get to the end. <laughs> Verse 20 reads, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou sayest, I will not transgress. Upon every high hill and under every leafy tree thou didst recline, playing the harlot. Yet mm -hmm. I, I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a righteous seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? For though thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith your whole God. Uh -huh. How canest thou say, I am not the fowl, I have not gone after the violin? See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift young camel traversing her ways, a wild ass used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind in her desire. Her lust, who can hinder it? All they that seek her will not worry themselves. In her month, they shall find her. Hold right there. That, that means right in there. That even with the, uh, with, with, with the uh, donkey out there and wild ass running, you know, yeah, you can't catch it there, but... But at a certain time of the month, certain year, she can be in the same location. So you don't have to go out there and say, look, this is where they're going to be at this time of the year, in this month. So that's what the creator is talking about us. You know what I mean? Running crazy everywhere, you know what I mean? Chaotic, you know? Same thing with describe us with animals and stuff like that. that, that, that um, with the same kind of lack of uh, intelligence, so to speak. All right. So we're going to skip on down to uh finish it you only got four got more verses. verses you don't want me to finish you sure, it you sure uh, okay great finish it out 28 verse 25 it reads withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst but thou sayest there is no hope for i have loved strangers and after them will i go as the thief is ashamed when he is found so is the house of Israel ashamed, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, who say to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought us forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in and time of not, the, mm -hmm. Yeah, at the time, say, we turn our back to the creator, but not our face. But then he's going to say, right, finish it out, but in the time. The middle of verse 27. Thou hast brought us forth, for they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. Mm. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can't save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Yehuda. All right, so we don't want to end on a bad note. You know, it's supposed to be a thing of a, a, a admonishment. That's why they try to end most hop tours on a good note. So we're going to do one verse from the third chapter um, of, of, of Isaiah, I mean, of Jeremiah. And then uh, and then we're going to go to, to which is the finish at that one verse to put it on a good note. And then we're going to go to the, um, the fourth chapter. So we're going to pick up uh, Jeremiah, the third uh, chapter, the fourth verse. Uh, three and four. Jeremiah chapter three, verse four. It reads, Didst thou not just not, Slinka, didst thou not just now cry unto me, my father, thou art the friend of my youth? So verse right, four. Right there and there. So... <clears throat> It's saying, look, after all this happened, you know, after the creator gave us, you know, I mean, talk about what 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 our fathers found wrong in him, and talk about what he did for us and how he brought us through, then we're gonna think about it after a period of time and we're gonna change and say, look here, 
you know, my father of my youth. Because the thing is that I ain't the same guy I, am, I was then. Where I depended on you, I stepped away from you like I didn't need you. But before, I depended on you. You know how children depend on you, and then when they get to a certain age, I don't need this. I don't need that. I can do this myself. I can do that for myself. You know, one of the funniest things I used to uh, uh, joke with my kids when it was coming up is tying shoes. Once they learn to tie a shoe, no, I can tie my shoe. <laughs> they have all kind of knots up in their head. <laughs> See, you know, they, they, you know, they start off good. And then I'll say, okay, let me see you take it loose and start over again. They got a knot. <laughs> and they try to pull it off. But but at least they, you know, you know, when they get to a certain point when they think they got it, they don't want, um, you know, they don't need you. Now we're going to the fourth chapter of Jeremiah. We're just gonna read uh first and the second verse only. This is way to support it. Jeremiah chapter four, verses one and two. If thou will return, O Israel, save Jehovah. Yea, return unto me. And if thou will put away thy detestable things out of my sight and will not waver, and will swear as Jehovah liveth in the tr in, in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then shall the nations bless themselves by him, and in him shall they glory. Hallelujah. All right, that's right. All right, that's what we're going to end that. That's um, remind us about what Abraham's job was. Abraham was to be a blessing unto the nations. So when we do right, we'll be a blessing unto the nations. Even in our wrong, we become a blessing to our nation, but we're not even a blessing to ourselves where they exploit us and use us. But if you're doing right, the real blessed one is one that brings a blessing and still is blessed while he's doing it and sharing that blessing. That's an all-win scenario. A losing scenario it's when somebody else is getting blessed by you and you get nothing out of it. That's almost like exploitation. So I hope you got something out of what I said. I know I went a little um, fast in some areas and uh, any mistakes been my own, but uh, hopefully you discuss some of the different parts I brought out uh, concerning the people. And at this particular time, like I said, next um, next week, this time would be the fast to shop it up. For those that might deserve it, which um, the ninth of August starts after it's Saturday night, uh, Shaba, and it, it comes in. So, you know, basically uh, the 6th of uh, August on a secular calendar. And, you know, uh, those that, um, you know, want to deserve it, it'd be good to consider what we had lost. Like I said before, is the opposite of that 9 11. We got 11 and 9. We got to consider. Uh, you know the tragedies that we had in our, in our life, and then see where we where, where we where we stand, uh, soul searching. Because one of the things that we ended with this chapter is that teshuva, repentance, and change, and you know feeling uh, um, regret about what we did. You know, when the when the evil decree is the, uh, coming from the Creator, we could change that by changing our life. When a blessing come. It's going to come, period. When God gives us a blessing, it's going to come, period. But an evil decree, we could change that by changing the way we, we, um, where we live. So we, this is the only God that we have that plead for us to come to him so that we won't bring destruction upon ourselves. It's not so much God bringing the destruction on us as we allow ourselves to be put in an area of destruction. It's like a child. You let him go out and play and say, don't go in the street. And they disobeying going to the street. And next thing they know, they get hit. So it was not you bringing the destruction on them. You cautioned them and warned them not to go in the street. But they go in the street and brought it upon themselves. So um, that way, sometimes we can't, we, we can't blame the creator for things that go bad in our life. We got to sometimes look at what did we do to bring those things in our life. But that's said, Shalom Aleichem and early Shabbat Shalom. And those that fast, have a good fast. That's the case I'm speaking to you. Prior to that. Right. Now see, there is there there is a question from someone um from a um from a stream before they send a question. This is from um screen name beautiful forever 
This is a sister. Um, Shabbat Shalom Chifuzio. It's beautiful forever. That's her screen name on the okay. on the chat. In the book of Numbers, <clears throat> the law of the of, of inheritance goes to the son once the father passes away. What happens to the wife? Does she leave the property? What happens if her father is no longer alive? And why she can't have some of her husband's inheritance? Why can't she have some of her husband's inheritance? I don't know if you caught all three questions. Yeah, I caught it, I caught it, I caught it, I caught it. I caught it. And uh, thank you for um, uh, considering me to try to answer your question the best I can. Uh, one, uh, the husband and wife being one, um, whether she happened to be the mother of one of his sons or not. He could have been a polygamist. He could have been, you know, a monogamous. All right. He could have had one wife. He could have had several wives. <clears throat> she stays on the property because she's part of him. But she has no authority to pass it down, and neither do they have the authority to put her out, you know, um, in, in, in that area. You know, it's um, almost, and if you, um, um, it might not be real clear apparently, but if brother and dwell together, or in, you know, same place, in, you know, not in the same house, but you know, in the neighborhood, and on the same property, and one has a wife and has no children by that wife, I right, so the brother will go into the woman and have a child, you know, and raise up a C in his brother's name. What it means, he may not be named after the brother, but the part of the inheritance that will went to his brother's children goes to him, but she's still on the property. So until she died. So she don't have to move while she's still married and she become a widow. She still is tied to the property. So I hope I answered your question. Also, um, the can a can a wife? Hold on, there's another question. Why can't she have some of her husband's inheritance? That's what she said. <clears throat> when it comes to land, the Creator made that clear. Right. When it comes to other stuff, he might have. He could give that directly to her. So if he got certain gold trinkets or whatever the case is, or he had a, a favorite, uh, you know what I mean, uh, a, a horse or, 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 you know what I mean, whatever, whatever it is, you know what I mean, daddy ride or a favorite uh, donkey that he ride upon or something like that there. Say, all, you know, this donkey here, these donkeys here, this is yours. These are yours, um, you know, period. And he, that would be done in his lifetime. We wouldn't even have to wait till he die. That would be done in his lifetime. You know, but, uh, but but when it comes to the land, that is specific and it's strictly for the creator. So she could claim anything or, you know, I mean, um, if, it, if she could support her claim when it comes to other items. Right? It's only the actual land which cannot be moved that must stay within a family tree. So um, uh, when, is, and when we read in the time of uh, judges with Caleb, the same guy that's put dealt with the inheritance, uh, had his daughter married one of his cousins, uh, his, his cousins, um, one of his, one of his relatives, um, as a as 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 a prize. But but she gave he gave a, a spring. Um, I don't know how that worked out in there, but it's during the time of judges. But he gave a, a particular spring as an inheritance. But but he knew what part of inheritance he had ahead of time before even they chose um, the lots at this particular time. So that's one of the unique areas there where she, she cried out about, you know, I got this uh, little parcel that we um, got that might not have been, um, would have been passed down technically, but, but it's still family because he married a cousin, a relative as well. So he said, okay, I'm gonna give you the spring as well. You know, cause you know, I just promised my daughter but uh, what are we going to live off of? You gave us a, you know, you gave me a daughter, but how are we going to live? So some fathers might say, okay, 
All right, you gonna be uh, you 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 gonna be my son-in-law. So they're still gonna be in the family like that. But they didn't know that it still be part of family land even in that. Another question. And so last week we spoke about divorces. So this week I want to speak about marriages, right? Um, in terms of Torah, Tanakh, and maybe you could give us insight a little bit on um, maybe what the sages um, spoke on, on divorces, or on marriages, I mean. Um, what is the appropriate, is there any one appropriate way of a woman and a man being married, married, um, can you, how does the Tanakh explain it? How does Torah explain it? We understand the, um, the diary of virgins. We understand, um, that part of, of Torah, right? Um, which a lot of us don't practice this day, diary of virgins. Um, but in terms of what is the correct way to go about, um, taking, Maybe a virgin, maybe a woman that's been married before, um, you know, on different scenarios, different circumstances. Would you care to explain that? Well, it'd be difficult, so I, I would have to tell you off the back, because um, I won't be an expert on the halakha rulings on that. I'm familiar with, you know, quite a bit of it, but I'm not, I won't consider myself an expert on that when it comes to rabbinic. Uh, but one thing I, w uh, I would say, because they have um, a difference in the Tanakh, all it is, you have an agreement, you know, and it's announced. That's it. It'll go into the details. So that's why I said in the details in the Tanakh, you have none other than agreement. If, and most of the times it might have been a version. But as you pointed out, you know, if she wasn't a version, you know, uh, what would be the details? What would be the agreement? Because we have situations where a woman is sold into a particular um, condition, like a father sell his daughter for the purpose of being married, and then uh, and, and and you know and we read in the book of Exodus, the twenty-first chapter, about that, and and she could leave uh, without a divorce, but it will be a hearing uh, because you know it says she don't need no paper for a divorce per se. But she still had to prove her case in that area. So um, the Tanakh doesn't give any particular uh, contract. But David, when he got Mikal, all he had to get was so many foreskins from the Philistines. So he doubled them out and got the foreskins from the Philistines. So that was part of his contract deal. And it was an announcement. It's coming from the king. It was there. But then he took her back from him. You know, so, you know, uh, so um, a lot of times when you look at the Tanakh for uh, details of marriages, it's very, very uh, obscure in some areas. Uh, with Jacob, you know, all we know is he had a celebration. With Abraham, we don't know what celebration, just it was his wife. Isaac, you know, you know, we, we read the story about how his wife was sent to him. And that was it, and it was agreement, and, and she had to say, say some say so on it. So <clears throat> we had too many. Don't different forget Shimshon. Huh? Don't forget Shimshon. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 Shimshon. Yeah, that, that was that was, a, that was another thing too, you know. But uh, so, do you think? So, do you think we get most of our understanding of a ceremony from the Shimshon incident? Because it seemed like they had a ceremony, a banquet, a feast. You think we get a mo that the most of the Torah or, or not even Torah, but most of society gets it from that, from that, um, from that. Well, actually, story. actually, the uh, the banquet was done with Jacob. We read about a banquet. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Right. So, so, so that's why I said that's you know. So everything else is kind of you know like you know uh, uh, obscure and and to not. And. And after the banquet, that's when he went in, after the celebration. Yeah, like the woman you take from war, right? The war prisoner. And you okay. take her to be your wife. There's no bank. Is there a banquet there? Like who who comes to, <laughs> she, okay. she doesn't have her family. Like you just finished literally killing all her father and- And that's good, and, 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 that's, and that's a good analogy. And, 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 um, 
And that's one of the rules of engagement that they talk about, you know, um, by the woman um, that you capture in war, you know, and one of the strange things about it is talk about, you know, you know, when you get a woman like that, what could possibly happen? You might have to send us doing this and that and the other. Um, I gave a follow up story on it before. You know, about, you know, you have war, then you get a woman, a captive, and then you have a son that turned out this way and that way, you know, that drunken and a glutton, all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> you read about that. So in reference to, um, there's also another area, too, that when you, while you're out there in a battlefield and you grab her up, there's no rule saying you cannot deal with her. It's only when you bring her back after the battle you bring her home and you want her to be a, you know and you find a one that you want to be a wife then the rules are brought in so and, you know and that's a a real eerie subject in the sense that um um it's like to create a no the minds of men and war and that's why i made um a statement in this particular thing about this uh midianites um when we went to fight against the midianites Said, what well, was the state of mind of these guys that that you know this top guy got wiped out and they're going to war because of what was done and yet they bring back all the, all these women and some men <laughs> so so that's the children of Israel and in, 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 in that sense so with the creator and when we talk about the the, the captives Moses brings out some new laws in Deuteronomy as we you know because that's what we read about how you treat a woman that's a captive in the book of Deuteronomy. And it's, it's strange that we read it then in the 40th year, and we don't read it prior to that. This thing is you brought it up, and I wanted to build on that. There's many people that believe that um, what Malek Dawi did was wrong in terms of taking uh, Mikhail back, you know, after um, Saul had given her to him. I forget the man's name. Okay, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, what is your... I just, I just read that today. I just read that this morning. Yeah. I, forgot, I forgot his name. What is your Patio. view... Patio. Your Patio, yeah. What is your view... What is your view on that? Do you think Malek Dawi was wrong for taking his wife back? Was there anything wrong in him taking her back being that she was with another man at that point? And he never gave her away and, I mean... He never divorced, I mean. So what, what's your opinion on that? Where, where will you stand on that? Well, the political, personally, that'd be a rough for any man to deal with, but David being a king, uh, I, number one. Number two is I'm actually the former king's son-in-law, and that was my prize. And the, the, the thing was that... <clears throat> It was Saul that gave her to the guy, not that she volunteered to go with the guy. So since Saul gave her to her, you know, that's her father, that's the king. <clears throat> you know, David's on the run and everything like that. And politically, that would have been a, a better move for David, you know, to get the rest of the tribes of Israel because Abner, the most of the tribes still follow around Abner and the house of Saul, even after Saul died. And David, that's why you read when David was like seven years, he reigned in, in, in Hebron over, over Judah and 33 years over the nation of Israel, a total of 40 years. So that means for those seven years that he was acting as king, he was not recognized by the rest of the, the nation of Israel. So, it, you know, it could be a whole bunch of, uh, you know, stuff going on with that in that area. But those are some unique circumstances involved. But he, he had a right to get his wife back because he didn't send her away. And you don't read where she volunteered to go away. She was ordered and presented from her, uh, by her father to this guy. We don't know what kind of protest. We don't know what, you know, whether she protests or not. But when she was brought back, it wasn't like she was going to say, look, here, I'm going to stay with this guy. So... That's something maybe other guys may want to discuss further. I haven't read or uh, looked into anything um, Midrash at Leo Legends and all that kind of stuff in reference to that area. Yeah, I, I've always been to the idea of 
Like that sin almost goes on Saul and on um the guy because if the guy if you really a Torah guy and even if someone is forcing you to do something, even let's say Saul gives it to you, you don't have to go into her. You don't have to touch her. You don't, you know, if you feel <laughs> that you're under the pressure, you feel like you're gonna be killed if you don't, you know. I'm just drawing the worst scenario ever. Like, well, uh, okay, so, well, uh, well, yeah. one of the things is that uh, one of the, um, the concepts I do bring up when I talk about that, uh, when, when the question is asked on other areas in reference to um, Mikhail being put away later on by David when he brought the ark back, <clears throat> and she said she had no children, you know, from a, and she had no children. And you read about children, that's, you know, pretty much she had, and, you know, I think in the book of Chronicles and stuff like that. Yeah, now, and I've read, you know, other, you know, comments on it, you know, so, so how do you, you know, correct this thing or how do you come to grips with it where it says she had no children or she had children, you know, and one of the areas is, is said that, uh, you know, a sister, I mean, you were looking at crowds so carefully and, you know, a certain amount of children, but she raised those children. And that's one of the comments on that, that she raised those children but she never had no children of her own herself. And therefore, you know, evidently the guy may not touch her because David had a rep. You know, everybody said, it's all matter gave it to me. But uh I don't want I I, I wanna, but you know, I mean I even come walk behind crying, I wanna, but I'm not gonna just jump on and take that. And some guys would be just sad about just having a wife to look at. And I don't, you know, and that's it. Let's say I got this, got this, got this princess. So, um, you know, which is not strange for some guys these days in time. Gotcha. So, um, you gotcha. know, that, that's so that's the question. You know, whether you touched her or not. You know, gotcha. and um, so the, and those are some of the um, things that he didn't touch her when they had touch her. And when 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 when, when the general said, "Look here, turn back unless I fall upon you," he didn't have no problem. <laughs> <laughs> David was David um reputation preceded him and um I guess he he put he put down he put it down long enough for people to know not to mess with his yeah. I yeah, guess because, so. because, because was, David wasn't there he sent his general right hallelujah so thank you once again Nasik for the insight for your um for your diligence and also for everyone out there on the on internet land um if you have any questions please leave them in the chat and the chat that's going on right now leave all your questions your um your whatever it is that you have just leave them there and we will surely leave them in the comments underneath this video even after the chat is gone um and we will try to get back to you with some answers all right we don't have the answers to everything, but we'll try our best to do um, whatever we can to answer your questions. So once again, and, yes. And I say check it out yourself, you know, if I can do yes. the research. There you go. Yeah. And remember, some of these things, you know, um, there might not be anything for it in the Torah, so a lot of it is being formulated from other passages, from putting you know, scenarios together, and that's how a lot of times we gather information. When things are not explicitly um, brought out in Torah, we, we just try to gather information from other books and see how our, um, and meaning within the Tanakh, to see how our forefathers did certain things. So, um, thanking you all once again, praying that the Most High God will cause you to have a beautiful Shabbat day, Shabbat service, whatever you might do, online, whatever it may be. And I pray that the Most High God give you um, good sleep and um, that you wake up in the morning refreshed and ready to praise. Shalom, shalom. And everybody, um, um, have, a, have a good day. Shalom. Right. Shalom. shalom.